Welcome back to the Exhausted docuseries. I'm Nick Polizzi. And I'm Dr. Pedram Shojai. Okay, if you watched our episode on the underlying causes of mood disorders, consider yourself primed for episode six on gut health and the human microbiome. Nick, would you please explain why the teachings on mood disorders have anything to do with your gut? Well, did you know that serotonin, frequently thought of as the mood molecule, is largely produced inside your digestive tract? So, you could say there's a slight connection between the two. But beyond just mood, the health of your gut biome is critical to the function of your entire body, including energy levels. It's been said that all disease starts in the gut, a leaky gut to be more specific. This is a condition whereby pieces of food penetrate through small tears in the intestinal wall and go where they're not supposed to go, your bloodstream. This triggers a cascade of events, none of which are good. The scary thing is that a large percentage of people in the developed world have leaky gut and they don't even know it. This notion that the health of your gut can have a big impact on your mood, energy levels, and immune function was first met with distrust from Big Pharma and the medical industrial complex, if you will. But once the data from major institutions started to stack up, they had no choice but to listen. And as you're about to witness, this remarkable frontier of human health offers all of us a rare opportunity to hack some of the seemingly unshakable ailments that plague our modern world. Nick will take us there. Before we go any further, what is the microbiome and why is it so important? What are all these critters inside us and why are they there? Are there really viruses down there too? Aren't those scary? Or can they actually help us? You're about to meet and get to know the vast civilizations in our lower regions. Let's dive in. Our energy is not just what we take in, but it's what we can digest and absorb. And that's where the gut comes in uh, immensely. So if our, if our gut is not working properly, if we're not ab absorbing the food that we need, obviously we're not gonna get that, um, the nutrients that are in our gut into to our cells where they need to be. Your digestive tract lining can actually get leaky so that things that aren't supposed to get absorbed in your bloodstream start getting absorbed in, like microscopic food particles. And your immune system finds these little particles in your bloodstream, knows they're not supposed to be there, and starts attacking them as though they were a germ. And so it just creates this inflammation in the bloodstream, and it goes everywhere in your body. And so you can have all kinds of stomach symptoms. You can have bloating and indigestion and heartburn and diarrhea, but you don't have to have any digestive symptoms, the second most common place to have symptoms is in your brain. Fatigue, insomnia, brain fog, poor memory. So if you want to have energy and a healthy brain, it's so important to have a healthy gut. I think this is one of the key foundations for energy and overall health, including our skin, because it all ties back to, a lot of this ties back to the gut health. Because if your gut health is not good, you're not gonna be absorbing nutrients from your food, which is one of the reasons people get nutritional deficiencies. It also ties into our hormones. We have the, the gut-brain connection. The brain is what helps signal the release of hormones. It also ties into blood sugar balance. And, and so all of this goes back to the gut. Another reason that gut health is so important to our energy is that your digestive tract lining is what decides what gets absorbed into your body and what goes straight on through. And so if you're not absorbing the vitamins and minerals in your food, I see this all the time. Women are trying so hard. They give up the foods that they kind of like to eat. They pick the salads. Like they're trying so hard. But yet if your digestive tract isn't healthy, you can't digest the vitamins and minerals. You can't get them into your cells. And if your cells don't have the fuel that they need, then you feel tired nonetheless. While we're in the actual gut itself, if our microbiome, those are the bacteria and that things that are housed in our gut that keep us safe. And actually there's more, there's more, there are more bacteria than there are human body cells. Um, so they really kind of run the show in our, in our lives. And so if they are not in, in alignment, if they're not the proper uh, ratio of specific bacteria, then what will tend to happen is that our body will not absorb what it needs to. And that's something that's called a dysbiosis, meaning bad biosis. Um, and if that happens, then we don't absorb what we need. We don't get the energy that we need. 
you have the dysbiosis going on in your gut, it's going to impact a lot of different conversions that are happening, the absorption of nutrients from your food. And, and so when we look at at gut dysbiosis, I would say a lot of times people say, oh, well, that's not an issue for me because my digestion's fine. I, you know, I go to the bathroom regularly, I feel fine. So that's not the issue. You don't necessarily have signs of digestive issues with gut dysbiosis. And sometimes it actually the first sign shows up on the skin or it shows up as low energy. So it could be something that you don't really think of having to do with the gut. In our gut, um, we have trillions of microbes, and those bacteria that live in our gut actually make chemicals that get released in our bloodstream, and they go through our bloodstream into our brain, and they affect how our brain functions and how we feel. So if there's an imbalance in those microbes in our gut, then the wrong sorts of of, of biochemicals get to our brain. And one of the most common things that we see is fatigue and brain fog, where you're just not functioning on all cylinders. So there's a definite connection between what goes on in your gut and what goes on in your brain. And your microbes play a really fascinating role. Tuning in and noticing when, you know, you, you just notice that you're more tired more often, when you notice that you're just not able to um, recover, say, from a workout as often. Um, you know your energy is, is dropping. You're not able to focus as, as easily. Um, it's There's a lot of things that you can look at, but I always like to start with food. I like to start with, with the gut because it is really like the central brain that, that, that it's the oldest brain, the bacteria in your gut. I mean, they're the ancient wisdom that we've had for the longest time and the, the gut bacteria and, and what they are thinking and feeling. I don't know how much they're thinking, but they're definitely feeling things and they are talking to our body. And what we eat is a communication to our body and the way that we feel is a communication that our body has back to us through our energy, through our, you know, our, the way we look, the way our skin looks, how fast we age, all of these things are uh, a communication that our body's giving us about the nutrients that we're intaking, how well we're digesting them. And so if you're feeling like your body's talking to you in some way, it's a good idea to go find out what the root cause of that is. And I always like to start with, with food, start with the nutrients. So when we look at the gut, one of some of the signs that show up are on the skin. And so for people who have chronic skin issues, acne, eczema, atopic dermatitis, seborrheic dermatitis, psoriasis, all these really common skin issues, a lot of it goes back to the gut. So when I'm working with patients on skin issues, a lot of times we're talking about the gut. And what what's so great, what led me to write my book, Clean Skin From Within, is I was doing these programs with my patients and they were talking about their energy and their skin and their weight. And they were tied all of this together. I didn't know that all of this was tied together by improving our lifestyle and getting back to addressing these root causes, especially the gut. We know that stress can affect our gut microbiome but it can also release stress hormones like neuroepinephrine. How does this affect our energy levels and overall health? When human beings are stressed, we know that the immune regulation actually goes up. So why do we get sick easier when we're stressed out? If our immune system is functioning better, why are we getting sick easier? And the reason is, and this, this person has discovered this through a lot of different research and, and you know, doing some of his own studies in the lab, it was traditionally known that if you wanted certain organisms to grow faster, you add norepinephrine, which is like adrenaline in our system. So you add norepinephrine to stimulate the growth of these bacteria so they can grow in the test tubes and you can do the studies that you need to do. And he's like, wait, people have known this forever. Wait a minute. And so he started doing more studies and learning more about this. Essentially, what's happening is the bacteria, the microbes, the, fung the fungal forms in our body, they respond more strongly to our stress hormones than our own body does, to our own neurotransmitters. So they, when our neurotransmitters are present, with our stress hormones, they go up, these bacteria start proliferating. And so they can grow faster, reproduce faster. And so if we have any kind of gut infection or, you know, most of the time human beings are exposed to all different kinds of bacteria every single day in your food, just in the environment. And if your immune system's strong, everything's fine. 
But if you have these stress hormones going, all of a sudden they're eating it up and they're like, oh my gosh, reproduce, reproduce. And that's how people are getting sick more easily when they're in a stressed out state. Another way that stress affects our digestion is it disrupts our healthy bacteria in our digestion. So the stress disrupts them, can cause certain bacteria to overgrow and certain bacteria to be too low. And when those gut bacteria are out of balance, that can also cause fatigue in the body. I think that's something that you have to consider with stress and digestion as well, is that you're, you're affecting that whole microbial organ and their ability to do, to do what they need to do because they also make short-chain fatty acids, they make vitamin K, vitamin B, and they need to be in a good, healthy, balanced you know, ecosystem, having a symbiotic relationship with each other in order to do that properly. You know, they, there's a study I read that said that we may even derive 8% of our energy from the short-chain fatty acids that are created in the gut. I mean, that's a lot of energy being created in the gut. And if we have that imbalance off because we're stressed and we're not in this relaxed state that, that the healthy gut microbiome expects, you know, when we're in that state of rest and digest, that's the state that evolutionarily these gut microbes have learned is their best state to function highly in. You know, so if we're missing that, we're going to be missing out on all of the benefit that they provide. There is new literature that indicates that some of the byproducts of the metabolism of our gut bacteria are utilizable uh, for energy within our bodies. And there's a lot of interest now in the role that the microbiota are playing in body energetics. Uh, certainly, some of the cofactors for energy production, B vitamins, uh, are manufactured by, by gut organisms, and so I think this is an area of, of really important research. Stress, we know, affects our digestion. It basically turns off our digestion. So when we're under constant stress, we don't digest our food well, which means we're not going to absorb our nutrients well. And if we don't absorb our nutrients, we don't have nutrients to make energy. So that's one way. Also, when we're under stress, we're more prone to something called leaky gut. Um, leaky gut is when the intestinal cells are not as healthy as they could be. And when the intestinal cells are not as healthy as they could be, it allows food to trigger our immune system. And so we get inflammatory responses to our foods. These would be like a food sensitivities, like say gluten sensitivity or dairy sensitivity. So now the foods we're eating, sometimes even healthy foods, are triggering an inflammatory response that causes fatigue. When you're in that state of stress, when you eat, you're also affecting the whole entire microbiome, which is another organ at this point. We, we, talk, we think of it as actually like a microbial organ inside of our body that weighs two to three pounds that has the same amount of metabolic activity as the liver. And if we're in that sympathetic state, based on what we know with microbial endocrinology and the communication between our stress state, our stress hormones, and the way that the bacteria respond to that, they are acting differently in that mode as well. You know, and it's even possible that, I mean, we don't know all, we don't understand the full breadth of how the microbiome works. It's so complex and it's different in each person. But it's suspected that more pathogenic organisms are going to respond strongly to stress in like a favorable way for them, and that some of our more native gut flora are going to have a, a more negative reaction to our stress. So stress likely promotes the bad bacteria and hurts the good bacteria. That's huge, not only for exhaustion, but for our overall health. So these have huge roles to play on our physiology at that moment, but also downstream effects, for example, that persistent elevation of cortisol. Uh, is one that has an effect on the gut bacteria, uh, which then plays back to this whole theme of increasing inflammation, changing the diversity and the various uh, organisms that live within us by virtue of higher cortisol, increasing the risk of having a higher leakiness or permeability of the gut lining, which further amplifies the cascade of inflammation. And by and large, that's something we absolutely have to uh, do our best to avoid. My main strategy for dealing with stressors in my life, and this is what I teach my clients, is focusing on and tapping into your gut intuition. Because most people are putting their stressors aside and saying, oh, it's going to be better later. Just kind of like hope and pray it will get better. But I really believe you have to trust your gut intuition and you have to trust your thinking. And then you have to take actions daily that help you get closer to what you're actually wanting. And, you know, when I'm working with somebody who's struggling like in a relationship or they're struggling with their job, 
they are often trying to tackle that situation from a very disempowered place. And so, you know, in those situations, they in some ways have given up or they don't totally trust their thinking. They don't speak up. They don't have the hard conversations. And that's what I'm finding. I mean, it's so bizarre because I do this work with gut health. I'm like helping people with their digestion. We do herbs. We like manage food and all these other things. And yet I so often these days am ending up having these conversations of like, how do you have this hard conversation with your husband about what's going on and what your needs are? Like I'm working with a, a client right now and she's really struggling to even just have like food work in her life. Like she's got some severe allergies. She's got some major health conditions that are going on and her family doesn't support her. So not only does she have the stress of her health condition that's going on, she has the stress of a lack of support from the people in her life. And she's learned to manage her life around that. But it's like having an arm tied behind her back and like limping on one foot because she's having to now try to help herself. She's exhausted. She doesn't feel good. She's allergic to all these different foods and, and she's getting better and she's dealing with these things. But she's also making all the food for herself and making the food for her family, creating two separate meals. And to me, that's like another additional stressor to her already very stressful situation. And so learning how and teaching people how to have those hard conversations to say, okay, guys, like I'm going to sit you down. We got to have a conversation. We got to talk about how can you support me and what does that look like? And I mean, it, it can get messy. You could be opening up a can of worms. All of a sudden people are like, well, you're not supporting me. You know, you've been sick for so long. I mean, it can open up a can of worms for sure. But I, I just really believe that people need to start having some of these harder conversations because they're literally creating so much stress in their bodies that it's making it harder to heal. Such a complex connection between exhaustion and your gut. How do you get a checkup on your microbiome? We can actually test the gut bacteria. We can find out who's living in there. Let's find out. Is there enough lactobacillus? Is there too much? Is there too little? And we can measure a lot of the bacteria as well as the yeast and um, other microbes in our digestion so we know exactly who's living in there and then we can address them. Then we can use herbs to address overgrowth of bacteria or we can use certain probiotics if we need to increase the bacteria. I'm a real advocate for testing your your gut health and, and testing your gut microbiome and there are a lot of different tests out there and a lot of um, really good information that you can get. I personally recommend all of my, my people, they work with their doctor to get testing and get it analyzed so that they can have a good um, customized nutrient intake. Now for me, for example, I I will do this every six months to make sure that I'm, I'm shifting and changing because my body needs different things as it goes through the year and my body can do a lot on its own, but it, it, I need certain foods to, to make sure I'm getting everything that my body needs for good energy. We also can look at food sensitivities uh, test for food sensitivities and find out which foods are triggering the immune system and the inflammation. And once we know which foods, then we can take those foods out of our diet and that will start to decrease the inflammation and the digestion. We can also use herbs and nutrients to help heal leaky gut. So if these intestinal cells are not as healthy as they could be because of stress, but they can recover, we can actually heal leaky gut. We just use the right nutrients and herbs to do that. For example, glutamine is, a, is an amino acid that the intestinal cells use to be healthy. So if we ingest glutamine, we can help those intestinal cells recover and heal leaky gut. Um, there's also, in terms of, say, imbalanced gut bacteria, there's so much we can do. Now, a lot of people, when they think of their gut bacteria, they think, oh, I'm just going to eat some yogurt or some sauerkraut or I'm going to take a probiotic. The thing is, is that now we know that that's likely not going to be enough and could even make things worse because in yogurt and other fermented foods, there's certain bacteria, but that might not be the bacteria that you need. And so sometimes I'll see patients who are have eating yogurt and fermented foods every day, and they end up feeling worse in their digestion because they're taking in too much of the wrong bacteria. I have nothing against probiotics by itself, but often they're very expensive. And my experiences, both with myself and people I work with one-on-one, -on -one, it's hard to adjust gut health, unless, unless you just had antibiotics and you basically have a blank slate. But it's hard to impact gut biome through probiotics. But 
incorporating any kind of prebiotics into your diet is, is usually pretty helpful. Um, out of the mushrooms, probably reishi and turkey tail are some of the more better things for your gut. And then there are other digestive aids too, things like digestive enzymes that can sometimes help a lot, especially for people who get a lot of bloating after they eat. And, you know, sometimes people think that their digestive tract is okay, but it's just been not okay for so long that they don't even remember what normal is like, or maybe they've never been normal, because really it's not something that we talk about a lot. So how do you really know if what's going on for you is really normal? I really like spices. I think spices are incredibly underrated, especially for gut health. Ginger, um, cinnamon, cardamom, clove, those are pretty amazing things for immunity as well. So incorporating those every day somehow into your meals of having some spice with whatever you eat. One of the important things to know about the gut bacteria or the microbiome is the bacteria living in our digestion is really determined by what we eat because we're feeding them. What we eat is feeding our gut bacteria. So it can make you think twice about what you're eating. If we're eating, say, a lot of sugar, we're gonna be feeding the bacteria that love sugar. If we eat the same food every day, we're gonna be feeding the bacteria that, eat, that love that type of food. So really, when we start to realize it, we're not just eating for us, we're eating for these bacteria, and it shifts the decision of what we're gonna eat. So many of us think that, well, I'm eating whole foods, or I'm eating healthy, so why am I not fitter? Why am I not, why don't I have more energy? And a lot of the times it's because you're not absorbing, your body's not absorbing the nutrients that you're actually eating. And sometimes it's because your body just doesn't like some of what you're putting in it. I mean, different foods work for different people and different, just like different diets work for different people at different times, but different foods, you know, they, they really need to match up with your unique body. If that's not enough, or if your problems are more severe, then sometimes finding a functional medicine doctor can be really helpful because there are tests that we can do that look at what kinds of microbes are in your gut, looks at is your immune system reacting to different foods, um, do you have the right vitamins and nutrients that your body needs, um, and, and where we find an issue, then we can get to work to solve the problem. Oh man, I thought I was all alone in here. Turns out I'm taking orders from a bunch of bugs? Well, I guess it got me or us this far. Did you know that there are bacteria and fungi in the forest that can actually infest small organisms like ants and even mice and make them do their bidding? Which usually doesn't end well for the host. This is how powerful the microbes within us are. Talk about mind control, all the more reason why we need to make sure the good bacteria outnumber the bad. Okay, what did we learn in that last segment? It doesn't matter how good you eat if you can't absorb it properly. Your gut biome is the gatekeeper when it comes to what actually makes it into your body as fuel. Dysbiosis is when the microbes in your gut are in an unhealthy balance that hurts your health. Symptoms of dysbiosis are foggy headedness, fatigue, and depression. Stress hormones like neuroepinephrine encourage bad microbes in our gut to reproduce at a much faster rate. Some of the cofactors for energy production, like B vitamins, are produced by the microbiota in your gut. Probiotics are not always the answer to gut imbalances. Spices like ginger, cinnamon, cardamom, and clove are beneficial for gut health. I hope you're enjoying this episode. We'll get right back into it in a second, but I wanted to take a moment to tell you how you can own the entire series. Below this video, you'll find a link to the full exhausted docu-series, as well as a bunch of powerful bonuses that you could bring into your home at a special discounted price. This also includes an exhausted companion guidebook that's jam-packed with powerful takeaways and action items from each episode. It's loaded with deep dive wisdom that isn't included in our free premiere. On top of that, we're hosting two live Q&As where you can ask questions directly to some of the renowned experts you see in these episodes. If you're interested in bringing these powerful healing solutions into your life, it's well worth checking out. Plus, proceeds from your purchase will help us on our quest to unveil new breakthrough medicines and share this information with the world. 
make sure you check it out. Now, back to this episode. Okay, where are we, including your microbes and my microbes, going next, Nick? That is creepy. Stop it with that. Dude, is that you talking or the E. coli? That's seriously, you're embarrassing me. Uh, I'm, I mean, us. Anyhow, you know as well as I do that in this next segment, we're tracking down the whereabouts of your immune system, 70% of which, drum roll please, lives in your gut. This one's a real mind blower to most people. Who knew that the body's primary defenses live in the coating of our intestines? Most of us think of white blood cells when we think of our immune system, but those brawny fellows are only part of the equation. There are trillions of other helpers when it comes to protecting our body from external threats. Turns out that like most things in the human body, there's much more going on than meets the eye. Pedram will expand on this for us. Yep, we're talking about macrophages, cytokines, and a whole host of other microscopic components. These guys are working in unison every second to keep the parts of you that are you safe from the outsiders that are not you. Talk about Taoist philosophy. There is little distinction between self and other. We're all truly one. And as you're about to see, when it comes to boosting your immunity and treating imbalances there, aka autoimmune disease, the first place to look is in your gut. For the most part, when you look at the immune system, the immune system is there really to protect us. So it's there to protect us from foreign invaders. So if something foreign comes in, like a bacteria or a virus, or immune cells pick that up with different scavenger cells, like, like called macrophages, they release signals out to other immune cells that come in like soldiers, like T cells and Echocilla cells, and they're there to destroy it. But they may have a hard time finding that foreign invader. So we have another cell in the immune system called B cells, and they make antibodies. And then those antibodies bind to the foreigner, the antigen, the virus, the bacteria, and then the immune cells can find it much more effectively. Immune cells that are overactivated or dysregulated tend to produce these small protein messengers called cytokines. There's a lot of them. I think there's at least 25, maybe more of these cytokines. Um, they're just little messengers that the, the cells use to talk to each other. And when the immune system is activated, there's a lot of chatter and the cytokine levels actually go up. I measure them in my practice and people who have immune system disorder. So I've, I've seen this many times. And interestingly enough, I see people with chronic fatigue, their cytokine levels are all really high. So what is going on there? A lot of crosstalk, you know, it's like, Something's brewing, but not something specific. I'm not saying, hey, this person's got an autoimmune disease, right? They don't have a, a named disease. They just have a lot of aberrant activity that's going on. So let's take this one step further. There is a specific cytokine called interferon, right? Um, and in the old days, before we had this new class of drugs to treat viral hepatitis, we used to give people interferon injections. The main side effect of interferon injections is, you guessed it, fatigue, right? That people feel like they got the flu, their muscles ache. So that's a clue, isn't it? Well, here are these protein messengers that our immune systems make that in excessive amounts can make us feel bad, right? Well, let's go one step further. Let's talk about the gut. Right? If, the, if you've got dysbiosis, which is a, an imbalance of bacteria in the gut, the immune system is going to have some chatter around that. Right? The immune system is saying something's not right here. Something's not right. So the immune cells start making more cytokines. And then the cytokines go into the brain and the person goes, yeah, I don't feel well, I'm tired, etc. So that links the gut and the immune system and the fatigue. The gut microbiome is trillions of bacteria, viruses, and fungi. I know that fungal yeast can get out of control and deplete energy. How does this happen? Yeast is a normal part of our microbiome. We have a lot in our gut, we have some in our nose, in our throat, and on our skin. So the presence of yeast by itself is nothing abnormal. But what happens is that it is opportunistic. So when something happens to our body, we get stressed, our immune system starts to get suppressed, yeast can start to overgrow, and when it overgrows, we get a whole collection of symptoms, including sugar cravings, digestive issues, 
brain fog, mood changes. You know, there's a litany of other symptoms associated with overgrowth of yeast. And it really kind of comes down to this sort of fundamental problem of our immune system not being able to control it. And, you know, yeast is just one example of, you know, many things like that happen where we've got things that are naturally part of us, different bacteria, different yeast, different viruses that normally live in our body. But as our immune system starts to get taxed, these things start to come out. So I think, you know, some people, if they get an overgrowth of yeast, have the idea that we just need to go in and kill, kill, kill. You know, remember, this is part of you and you're never going to kill it 100%, nor do you want to do that. Yeast is actually a very important part of our microbiome that does a lot of very beneficial things for us. But again, it really is about controlling it. So it comes down to controlling diet, controlling stress, getting better sleep. And we do use antifungals, whether they're natural or prescription, to help control that overgrowth as a short-term solution. But ultimately, the way that we stop this from happening again is getting you know, better control of our life. Another thing that's very common, also hard to diagnose, is fungal overgrowth. And that's, again, the weakened immune system will cause yeast, saccharomyces, and other types of species to overgrow in the small bowel. And they produce toxic metabolites, uh, something called acetylaldehyde. Acetylaldehyde is the same byproduct your liver produces when you detoxify alcohol. So it feels like a hangover when you have yeast overgrowth. And some people even have organisms in their, in their gut that ferment sugars and create alcohol. There's something called auto brewery syndrome, which is crazy. They have a brewery in their gut, but you can imagine how fatigued they'd be if they had alcohol being produced in their gut all the time. Whatever you consume and eat, as soon as it hits your mucosal membranes in your mouth and starts to impact your immune system as you swallow it into your gut, is going to impact your immunological response. So if the gut's unhealthy, that is a significant player in fatigue issues and injury issues because of the systemic inflammatory response that it causes, disruption of immune metabolism, uncoupling of mitochondria. So, you know, once again, uh, a healthy microbiome uh, is a key thing. So a healthy um, diet away from processed foods and inflammatory foods and vegetable diversity are all the key things that make the microbiome healthy and improve uh, the immune system. Another great example is shingles. You know, for anyone who had chicken pox as a child, as a five-year-old, you can get shingles as a 55-year-old. It's been there for 50 years, it's been part of your body, and you've left each other alone. But as your immune system starts to get taxed and it gets suppressed, that virus comes out and you get this outbreak of shingles. So, you know, we've got a lot of these examples where, you know, it's really a, it's a a visible monitor of what's going on with your immune system. You know, it can be very hard to measure how well your immune system's functioning. We don't have good blood tests that do that. But when you start to feel run down and tired, and you notice that you get a white tongue or white coat on your tongue, and you start craving sugar all of a sudden, and you're getting really moody, you know, that can be a clinical sign that you're getting this overgrowth of yeast. And we do have other ways of measuring yeast overgrowth so that people can help identify that and to treat it appropriately. But ultimately, I think it comes down long term you know, how do we prevent it? We need to make sure that we're keeping our immune system happy and healthy. There's more and more research now on the microbiome that, that are looking at these, you know, tens of trillions of bugs and showing that there are different molecular signatures in individuals. A study just came out out of McGill University that showed that people with fibromyalgia, right, which is a a condition that's marked by chronic fatigue and muscle aches, had a really distinct pattern of bacteria in their gut. Enough so that they said they claim in this paper that they were actually able to look at the microbiome and they could say, you've got this bacteria, this bacteria, and this bacteria. And they could say, we're 80% sure that person's got fibromyalgia without knowing anything about the person. That is just plain crazy. And part of what's crazy is that it goes beyond this notion that um, it's one bad bug. It's not just one virus or one fungus, one toxin, right? It's the whole system. So in this McGill study, you know, there was, I think, at least 10 different bacteria where they were saying, when you've got this collection of these 10 bacteria, which are not necessarily unhealthy bacteria, but, you know, when they get together, they're rabble rousers. You've had some personal health challenges and it's led you to learning a lot about gut permeability. Can you explain that? When I was sick and I was trying to understand my own physical health, uh, after I kind of came out of the acuteness of being sick, I interviewed 34 people and put together the fibromyalgia summit. And fibromyalgia, the definition of fibromyalgia is uh, muscular pain, fatigue, 
um, that, that it's kind of a culmination of symptoms, including brain fog. So one of the people that I interviewed for the summit was a woman named Sarah Ballantine. Sarah is better known as the paleo mom. She is an autoimmune researcher. She has fibromyalgia herself, and I'm sure that most of her research was, was a way for her to get better. So Sarah started to talk about uh, what autoimmune diseases are and that uh, they, they are uh, the symptom of gut permeability. So when uh, there are small tears in the gut, uh, particles and other things leave from your intestinal tract and get caught in, in your bloodstream. So th this causes inflammation which causes things like fibromyalgia. How does it cause brain fog is kind of the next piece, which is this gut-brain axis connection. I mean, all, all the bacteria in your gut, if they're in your bloodstream, they're gonna cause problems, right? So if you don't have an intact gut barrier, if you've got leaky gut syndrome, which was the kind of thing that mainstream doctors would laugh at if they heard 15 years ago, leaky gut, give me a break, right? And now it's in all the medical journals. You know, we have a different terminology to describe it, intestinal hyperpermeability, right? You know, loosening tight junctions. Uh, so we can talk about it in a technical way and somehow that makes it okay. But it's leaky gut, right? Leaky gut is a real thing. It's not made up. It's not alternative medicine. It's the real thing. So if you've got leaky gut, then the healthy bacteria in your gut, fragments of them can get into the bloodstream. The immune system will see them react to them, and cause an inflammatory cascade. And that inflammatory cascade leads to cytokine production, and the cytokines make you feel achy and tired and bad. When you have an autoimmune disease, your body's attacking itself. So there's no room for just the basic fundamental support that your body, those mechanisms that your body has to stay in a balanced state, to create optimal health and repair, and to give you energy. So if you end up with an autoimmune disease, of course, there are things we can do to address it and support it. But certainly, that's why I want people to try and avoid getting to that point if you can. If you keep on the path of denying the root causes, you may end up with an autoimmune disease. That is so much harder to treat. But again, if you have an autoimmune disease, it's not impossible, but you've got to address it. Where do we start? There's so many things going on. You can't go wrong if you start with the gut because it's the, it's the interface with our environment. It's this tube that goes inside our body, but it is the one interface we have with the external world because right along that cell layer that lines the gut is the bloodstream, which is the immune system. So pretty much all of autoimmunity and a lot of these things we see manifest, they start with the gut and the gut health. So the gut is really important, and especially with fatigue, because all of these bacteria, if there's too much of the wrong thing in the wrong location, which is the example of SIBO or small intestinal overgrowth, it's not pathogens, it's normal microbes in the wrong location where they have no business being, and then they wreak havoc because they create metabolites that are toxic. They go right into the bloodstream and overload the liver, so it's like a toxic overload from within. The conventional medical approach doesn't really know what to do with autoimmune disease. There's not a lot of treatment options for people with autoimmune disease that really help address it or maybe even reverse it. And that it's something you're often told if you have an autoimmune disease, you're going to have this the rest of your life and it's going to be a constant battle, constant struggle. And that's really unfortunate because there are a lot of things that we can do to support the body, the immune system to help someone live the life that they want to live. In my experience working with people that are chronically ill, if they have food sensitivities, if they have clear and distinct gut permeability, um, their symptom, a lot of my clients, their brain fog will increase if they eat a food that they are sensitive to. So there's a direct correlation between the health of the gut and this experience of brain fog. Now that doesn't explain all brain fog, but in terms of autoimmunity, th there's a, a direct connection between that symptom and the health of the gut. So for anyone who's been dealing with Lyme disease or any other chronic illness, there's always hope. You know, it is built into our DNA to heal. 
it is built into our being to repair itself. I think where we get stuck is that there's other things going on that we haven't either identified or addressed that stop that natural process from happening. So, you know, for people who are feeling hopeless and helpless, and maybe they've already tried 10, 12, 15 other treatments that haven't worked, it may just be that you haven't found that one that has. So it's just a function of really staying in the game, getting your mindset straight, and keep working towards, you know, improving your health. And as you keep working on that, you know, the body does have that capacity to heal again. We just need to give it the tools to do that. Okay, time out. This segment might be one to bookmark. So many folks are suffering from autoimmune disorders and our experts just laid out a pretty extraordinary roadmap to recovery. The crazy part is that most of us didn't even know what the term autoimmune disease meant 20 years ago. Thankfully, the science is out now and we understand the symptoms and illness that causes them is very real. Let's recap some of what we just learned. All autoimmune disease begins in the gut. To treat any autoimmune disorder, you need to better understand how your microbiome is functioning. Cytokines are the messengers that your immune system uses to communicate with each other. Fatigue is often a symptom of overactive cytokines and an overactive immune system. The yeast in us is very sensitive to foods we ingest and overdoing sugar can cause yeast overgrowth. If you have leaky gut syndrome, it allows bacteria in your gut to leak into your bloodstream. This causes an inflammatory cascade. Did you know that we naturally harbor millions of viruses inside of us, some of which are thought of as being the more dreaded microbes of our time? These critters are often down there in our intestines, and guess what? Many of them are essential to the balance and function of our microbiome. And among all the trillions of microorganisms within us, there's some good guys and some bad guys. It's almost like a microcosm of our human civilization. If you think about it from that example of the complex world stage that we find ourselves on right now, good diplomacy always goes a long way. No culture, whether it's humans or bacteria, wants to be annihilated or even mistreated. So what do they do when they sense that's coming? They fight back. Everything in nature has a survival instinct. The best way to create a safer and happier globe is through communication and the deepening of relationships. Well, the same goes for your gut biome. Nick will take us there next. Once we know who our allies or probiotics are, we can empower those bacteria to do their job even better. On the other hand, once we identify the bad microbes, we can figure out ways of bringing them back into balance. The best way to do this is by using a number of diplomatic lifestyle interventions that encourage them to change behavior or leave us all together. But first and foremost, how do we identify which are bad and which are good? How do we encourage the growth of the good guys while renegotiating with or booting the bad guys? Buckle up, here we go. What is interesting to know about the microbiome is that the microbiome in a healthy person isn't just good, good guys. It's not just probiotics. The healthy microbiome in a healthy person is all different kinds of bacteria. Pathogenic bacteria are present. You know, pathogenic fungi are present. Um, I mean, they're just floating around, hanging out, doing their thing, you know? And if you look at some of the microbiomes of indigenous people, we find that they actually have very highly diverse microbiomes, many, many different kinds of species. And often they even have ones that we now today consider pathogenic. Sometimes people don't know that they have a gut issue, right? They, they don't have external symptoms like a pain in their stomach or diarrhea or constipation. They don't have reflux. Those are all the easy flag, you know, we know what we're dealing with kind of things. We know kind of where to go to look for things. But a lot of times people have this fatigue or they have a rash that won't go away or they have their eyes are always bloodshot or, um, 
you know, they're nebul nebulous symptoms. They have sinus infections that just won't go away, or they have ear infections that happen in our children over and over and over, and we're not sure what's going on. Well, as a, as a true ND, right, I'm a naturopathic doctor, we believe everything starts in the GI, right? 80% of your immune response comes off of the GI. Um, something like 80% or 90% of our neurochemistry comes off of the GI. So oftentimes that's the first place a functional medicine doctor or a naturopathic doctor is going to look. And so you may not have GI symptoms, but we may need to go look at the GI to see if there's Yes. Um, is your diversity off in your microbiome? Do you have an infection? Do you have too much candida albicans, which is a yeast growing in there? Do you have something more pathogenic, like a like a um, hemolytic um, E. coli infection um, that you didn't even know? You just kind of felt run down, and here you all are harboring a, a parasite or a bacteria or a virus in the microbiome that is constantly dragging you down. One of the interesting things about the gut is that we have a subset of bacteria in our gut called the estrobolum. And the estrobolum is responsible for coding for enzymes that break down, breaks down estrogens. So one of the most common hormonal imbalances amongst women, that almost every woman that you know that I know in my life has experienced estrogen imbalances to some degree uh, in a form of whether it's PMS, PMDD, absent, irregular, or very painful, heavy periods, whether it's lumpy boobs, you tell me which woman doesn't have a, didn't have lumpy boobs at one point in her life, right? Whether it's fibroids, endometriosis, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, um, thyroid nodules, um, hips that are fat around the hips and cellulite that just wouldn't melt away. Uh, those are all symptoms of estrogen dominance. And guess what? Those, uh, those enzymes that are being produced in order to break down those estrogens properly to make those symptoms go away um, are partly metabolized in the gut. And so, so you know, it, it goes back to the quality of the bugs, if you will, that we have in our digestion, right? That's going to play a huge role in how we can support these symptoms and support our body metabolizing estrogen properly. The microbiome is definitely a hot, trendy topic uh, these days, but it's a very basic part of humanity. We often hear it said that the human body contains about 10 trillion cells, and the five pounds of material that's in your gut contains 10 times as many bacteria or organisms, mainly bacteria, uh, 100 trillion. That number has been revised over the last couple of years. It was probably overestimated for our body. So our body is probably more like about 30 trillion and it was probably way overestimated in terms of the uh, number of gut bacteria. And so they're probably also about 30 trillion. So it's more like one to one than 10 times as many. But isn't that amazing? You weigh 150 pounds and your cells, 30 trillion, but the material in your gut is only five pounds. And again, as many as is in your body. So you have a little personal zoo in your gut and there are up to uh, close to a thousand different species that actually can live in there uh, m most people have in the range of 400 of the most common. So our personal zoos usually are in the 1 to 200 uh, range. But even that's pretty amazing. So they live in there. They carpet the walls of the uh, large intestine. They're not doing the backstroke through your feces. They're stuck to the walls of your large intestine. They go in there, conquer territory, and live there forever unless they're ousted. Antibiotics are often prescribed for inflammation and infections, but they can have a negative effect on the bacteria within us. How does that play out? Not until recently has leaky gut syndrome come on the map. And what the primary, the original insult was antibiotics. Antibiotics have only been mainstream since the 1950s. And that just destroys all your gut bacteria. There's 500 species, and, and you know, of which lactobacillus is just, 5% of the, the load of what we have. I mean, it's very diverse, very complex. When you take antibiotics, you wipe out everything. But bacteria grows really fast. But the bad stuff comes back faster than the good stuff. So people take antibiotics just to have dysbiosis. They don't have good gut bacterial health. You need that bacteria that takes care of 80% of the poisons that come into your body are neutralized by your gut bacteria. You don't have them, you're gonna have an immune problem. You have an immune problem, you're gonna have an exhaustion problem. 
So antibiotics are like the worst thing you can do for yourself, just the worst. You know, and Chinese herbs are so good on bacterial infections, including serious things, strep throat, impetigo, post-surgical, and by, uh, Chinese herbal antibacterials work great if you work with somebody who knows what he's doing. So when we're born, of course, our gut is completely sterile. There's nobody in there yet. And then uh, when we breastfeed from our mother, the milk in the actual um, milk duct in the mother has already started to ferment with healthy bacteria. So it's the beginning of yogurt, basically, that when the baby drinks that. And so within 10 days, the baby has a real nice colony of healthy gut bacteria that live on breast milk. And uh, over time, those gradually change and other things come in from the environment and the skin of other people and dirt and whatever the baby gets in there. And, uh, and that ends up with your own little personal combination, healthy uh, bacteria. The things that kill them are funky diet, stress, and antibiotics. So if you haven't been exposed, antibiotics being the main one, so if you haven't taken antibiotics, probably you have the same good bugs in there that you had uh, when you were born. One round of antibiotics is enough to wipe out the entire zoo in there. Um, it may or it may not. It's just kind of a chance thing. So some people have taken many rounds of antibiotics and things are still doing more or less okay. But that's it's a serious risk factor. So you kill them off and now somebody is going to come in and establish territory there. They fight for territory like uh, battling armies. And once one has established its encampment in the territory, it's very difficult to, uh, uh, to kick them out. So antibiotics starts the problem. Wipes out the good stuff, bad stuff comes in. People say, I have SIBO. I've been diagnosed with SIBO, which is small intestine bacterial overgrowth. And I say, trying not to be sarcastic, I just say, everybody has SIBO. Every, everybody I test has SIBO. Everybody has SIBO because they have antibiotics. People say, well, I don't take antibiotics. Well, you eat pork, you eat chicken, you eat cultivated fish, trout, you eat cultivated salmon, you're getting antibiotics. You eat beef, you're getting it. Oh, mine was range fed, not for the last two weeks of its life when it was in a feedlot and given antibiotics. You know, I eat eggs, antibiotics. Try to make sure your food does not have antibiotics in it. It's horrible. It's a, it's a real crisis. It's a real crisis. So that's what starts it. But other things will add to it. All these chemicals in the environment cause dysbiosis, okay? Uh, if you don't have enough stomach acid, if you take antacids on a regular basis, you're not going to have the pH to promote good bacterial health. So leaky gut is really a bacterial problem. However, what happens is certain bacteria and funguses like candida will cause erosion and damage to the epithelial cells of the small intestine and large intestine, more the small intestine. That's what leaky gut is. You've now damaged the cells. You're now absorbing foods before they've been digested. You're absorbing toxins that have not been neutralized. And now you're going to have the the sequential of that, which is fatigue, joint pain, headaches, all sorts of problems. The big toxic load. So all these things that can interrupt our gut bacteria and cause dysbiosis, what effect does that have on our energy levels? Dysbiosis affects our energy in many different ways. I mean, you can have on one extreme end a gut infection with pathogenic bacteria where I mean, you literally have inflammation being created as an you know, immune response, and the body is kind of under attack. You, know, you can have that level of infection. And we know there's all these different pathogenic bacteria that can lead towards autoimmune disorder, um, nervous system issues. I mean, we have so many, uh, clear, like, so many bacteria clearly that we understand what they do if, they're, if those infections are kept around for too long. And these people are not dealing with the same modern chronic conditions that we deal with in our culture. So what's fascinating to me about that is that, you know, there's, so, well, first of all, there's so little that we really know about the microbiome. We're trying to do all of this stuff and manipulate it in all these ways. And it just makes me want to keep getting back to like, what are the basics? How do we get back to the basics? How do we stop trying to manipulate it so much? Like taking all of these things to, you know, these designer probiotics, as I call them, to try to make it be a certain way. We don't know exactly what that certain way is supposed to be yet. We're still not totally educated about that. 
There's bugs that live in there, mainly bacteria, but, you know, the odd uh, yeast and other fungi and even some uh, virus organisms uh, produce substances that is, are there for their own benefit. So they live on our food. That's their job is to help metabolize the food that, was, that we ate for our own nutrition. But they turn it into things that they want to, uh, to produce for their own body. But we've co-evolved with them for so many millions of years that it's part of being human to have those in there. And they actually make some beneficial compounds that support immune function and, in general, enhance the environment in the gut so that you can finish uh, absorbing the nutrients from your digestive tract. Again, a little bit of an immune boost, uh, some B vitamins, things like that, that we, uh, we require uh, in there. So we have this give and take relationship with them. We feed them and then they give us the things that we need. So having a healthy microbiome uh, is important in terms of the neurotransmitters that uh, your brain responds to. Uh, the nutrients that we need for energy, uh, mood, and just to run every function of the human body, really, we're just absolutely intricately connected. In somebody who isn't as healthy and they're experiencing dysbiosis, that's imbalanced, they're going to have microorganisms in there, in their digestive tract, digesting our food and also digesting some of the other excretions created by other bacteria. Like They all piggyback on each other. It's an ecosystem. They're feeding each other. And some of these microorganisms that we consider pathogenic, we call them that because what they excrete is toxic for us. The organism itself isn't the harmful thing, it's what they're excreting that's not good for us. And so when we look at the small intestine, for example, it's one cell layer away from our bloodstream. I mean, we're, that's our most intimate relationship with nature right there, one cell layer away. And so these chemicals can absorb directly into the bloodstream, these toxins that are being created by these microorganisms. They can go straight into the bloodstream. And where does the blood go from the digestive tract? It goes to the liver first. And it goes there because we need to make sure that we detoxify anything so we don't have blood going to the brain, one of our most important organs that's controlling so many things. We don't want blood, dirty blood, to go to the brain. So it goes to the liver first to make sure, okay, what do we need to clean up here before we send the food and this new fuel to the brain? What are we going to leave here in the liver? What are we going to excrete first? So when we look at this dysbiosis, we're essentially overloading the liver with a bunch of toxic junk. You know, now this person, that's what I call the human sewer situation, where you have this metropolis of bacteria living in your gut, and you have this wonderful sewage system for them, your bloodstream, and now the water treatment center is overloaded, you know? The liver is just doing way more than it's ever been assigned to do in the past, especially when we add in all the environmental toxins that we're exposed to, and stress impacts it as well, because the liver has so many different jobs, and there's certain priorities, so certain things will get kicked back, like a hormonal balance will sometimes get kicked back and, and, and these toxins will get prioritized. So people will end up with hormonal imbalances and things like that because their body's just focused on detoxifying whatever's coming through the bloodstream because that is most important. We need to protect the brain. The hormones, okay, sure, a little bit of imbalance, is, that's not going to kill us. It's like the liver knows what's going to kill us, what's not, and that's its priority list. So how do we strengthen or increase the good bacteria in our gut so we can optimize our energy levels? A lot of people don't think of healing their gut in order to give them good energy levels, but the reality is that your metabolism actually starts in your gut, and your metabolism is responsible for um, how much energy you're obtaining from the things you're eating and drinking. So we really want to focus on gut health because if our gut health isn't up to par, it doesn't really matter what you eat or drink, you're not going to be absorbing the nutrients from it. So the first steps that we take with our clients to help them improve their gut health is um, to be taking probiotics and they can, you know, you can do that from foods like kombucha or kimchi or kefir or sauerkraut. Those are high probiotic foods. And also a probiotic supplement is a really good way to be getting in that good bacteria to crowd out the bad bacteria. What probiotics are, are those specific bacteria in specific ratios that are normally meant to be in our gut. So if they're, if we have the wrong ratio, and we're not absorbing the things that we have, then we can sometimes take a probiotic that will help us to reestablish that proper, that proper ratio. 
sometimes people are really tired because they have a histamine response going on and they're taking a probiotic and wondering, why do I feel worse? Well, there's lactobacillus species in there that are adding to the histamine that are making them feel worse. So we're finding that we need more bifido bacterium or certain spore probiotics that actually are going to make people feel a lot better that have a histamine problem that don't aggravate that histamine problem. So it's a difference between two different probiotics, right? And how well you'll respond. So not all probiotics are equal. I am a big advocate of prebiotics as well as probiotics. Uh, whether you're doing prebiotics in the form of foods or whether it's in the form of supplement, it doesn't really matter. Both of them have their role and they are great. And probiotics, you know, I'm a big fan of fermented foods, traditional foods, right? Whether it's sauerkraut, dill pickles, you know, bring on the kimchi. Um, you know, if you feel good eating um, fermented foods, it's just a wonderful addition uh, to, our, to our daily diet. And it's interesting because there are specific bacteria that are made for losing weight. There are some that are there for, for energy. They have various things. There are some that make vitamins. You know, some, a lot of the vitamins that we have in our body are made by our gut bacteria. So if they're not, you know, if they're not uh, in the right order, if they're not the right number, um, in the right place, because they could even be the right bacteria just in the wrong place, then we will have difficulty with energy. Fermented foods absolutely plays a role in helping people who are exhausted and have low energy because you're helping to create more diversity in the microbiome when you eat fermented foods on a regular basis. And if you look at all the different fermented foods out there, I mean, you can get hundreds of different, of, you can, well, I'll just say, you can get dozens of different species of bacteria and yeasts that have a probiotic effect and help create that diversity within the gut microbiome. So yeah, I, I love fermented foods. I think it's a great place for people to start. But the other cool thing about them is that these foods, when they're fermented, they're actually pre-digested. So you look at something like miso, which is basically fermented beans and rice. There's this mold in miso called Aspergillus oryzae, and this mold breaks down the rice, it breaks down the beans, and it actually pre-digests all that protein into these free amino acids. It excretes all these other organic acids that are really supportive. They act as fertilizer in the gut. And that fertilizer helps create the right environment for the right microbes to grow. And there's many other amazing benefits to miso as well. But like, I think this is a really cool ferment to think about because it's pre-digested. So we're giving our, our, our body a break. Our digestive systems suck compared to most animals. You know, we have to cook our food. We have to like ferment our food. We have to pre-digest our food in all these different ways in order to actually pull the nutrients we need. So anytime we can give ourselves a hand, I think it's a really smart idea. And we can do that very, very efficiently with fermented foods. We want to focus on healing the thin lining of the digestive tract. And glutamine is really, really good for that. Um, you can get that from eating you know, animal protein. You can also get that from a supplement. And the great thing about glutamine too is it's a precursor for your neurotransmitters, which are your brain chemicals, which determine whether or not you get sugar cravings. So, And we know that sugar can be a really big drain to our energy levels. So the great thing when you're healing your gut and you're taking in probiotics and glutamine is that you actually end up craving less sugar in the process. Plus, you're going to absorb more nutrients because you're healing your gut. We have great tests now to, to look at the microbiome and we're always learning more. You know, we're at the baby um, stages of really understanding the microbiome, but it's pretty fascinating from what we do know now. And what we do know now is very different than what we knew five years ago or 10 years ago. Go and look under the hood and see what is the root cause of your exhaustion. Stop relying on magic pills and promising supplements that promise to give you that energy back, look at really what's zapping it, and that's going to be your answer. Wow. Balancing the microbiome feels like a chess game where you're making dietary moves to move friendly pieces forward and take out those that oppose your overall health. This is a little different than what we learned in health class. Isn't it interesting? the number of existential questions that this episode is raising. For example, who really is controlling your impulses would take a whole new docu-series to cover. Baby steps. Let's rewind for a second and hear what we just learned. The microbiomes of indigenous people are highly diverse, including many microbes that we would consider to be pathogenic. Leaky gut is a modern disease, and one of its primary causes is antibiotics. 
Bacteria excrete other substances for their own benefit, not for us. Through coevolution, our bodies learn to make use of these. When we have dysbiosis, certain bacteria in our gut are excreting chemicals that are not good for us. Eating probiotics on a daily basis helps to build up the good bacteria while crowding out the bad bacteria. Glutamine helps to heal the thin lining of the digestive tract, a big deal when we're trying to heal leaky gut. Before we go, make sure to click the button below this video to find out how you can bring all nine episodes of the Exhausted docuseries plus a bunch of powerful bonus resources into your home for life. Every one of us deserves to know the full spectrum of healing options that are out there for us. The information in this series is something you will want to come back to again and again whenever you experience a feeling of energy depletion or fatigue, be it with your own health or that of your family and friends. You can own the all access package at a special discounted price during this event only. Now is the time. The burning question that's been haunting me this entire episode is, if these trillions of microbes in and on us can change our moods and even our thoughts, who's the one steering the ship here? Uh, you are. But who am I? Like, like, where am I? Whoa, man, let's save that question for another series. These folks came here to heal their fatigue, not to become more exhausted with your quandaries. Fair enough. Can you tell these good folks what we have coming up next time? I'd love to. Episode seven's coming up. We're gonna be diving into an organ that you've heard mentioned a few times in this last episode. It's connected to a number of bodily functions. Perhaps the most important one is to vacuum or filter out the toxins that you're exposed to every day. We're talking about your liver and considering that toxic load is a huge cause of fatigue and a number of other health challenges, liver health is an absolutely vital part of the exhausted conversation. This is not one to miss. We will see you next time. Bye for now.